Enga mana, enga reo, e ro rangatira mā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia ora koutou katoa. Nō no mai haere mai, koutou katoa ki te herenga waka. Ko Margaret Highland, toko ingoa, ko te tumu maru ārangi, ke te herenga waka o e mahiana. Welcome, distinguished guests, dignitaries, the Antarctic Society, the Antarctic Research Centre Advisory Board, and the scientific community to the 20th annual S.T. Lee Lecture in Antarctic Studies. I'm Professor Margaret Highland. I'm Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research here at Te Waka, Victoria University of Wellington, and it's my very great pleasure to host all of you tonight. I'd like to extend a particularly warm welcome to Professor Tina van der Vleut, uh, our guest speaker for this evening. Professor van der Vleut is here tonight because of the generosity of the late Dr. Lee Sung Tee, for whom this lecture series is named. During his lifetime, Dr. Lee su supported a number of prestigious universities throughout the world, including Oxford, Cambridge, and Harvard, in building libraries, offering fellowships, and sponsoring annual lectures. His extraordinary record of philanthropy and support of education and learning spanned several decades, and his legacy continues after his passing last July at the venerable age of 99. Dr. Lee received an honorary Doctor of Literature from Te Heringa Waka Victoria University of Wellington in 2006. The university is grateful for his support and his efforts to foster excellence in education and the continuing support of the Lee Foundation. Events such as this lecture contribute to the world-leading scholarship undertaken by the university's Antarctic Research Center and their goal to better understand Antarctic processes and their influence on climate change and the consequences both globally and for New Zealand. The university's involvement in Antarctic research goes back over 60 years. Our Antarctic Research Centre was formally established in 1972, providing a platform for our, our scientists to lead the way in developing drilling systems to extract geological samples and better investigate ancient climate changes on, Antar on the Antarctic continent. Uh, the centre also offers teaching and government advisory services with several staff involved in prominent international efforts, such as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. More recently, the centre has become a global leader in the computing, computer modelling of glaciers and ice sheets in response to climate change. It has grown to be recognised as a world leader in Antarctic science and a key player in major research operations attracting significant government investment and interest. The Antarctic Research Center's work contributes significantly to the university's efforts to enhance resilience and sustainability, to maintain research partnerships with local and global organizations, and contribute to the resolution of some of the most pressing challenges facing the world today. The annual ST Lee Lecture is an important event in the center's calendar. It provides a valuable opportunity to hear from an internationally renowned guest and to celebrate the successful research and collaboration programs being undertaken by our scientists. Our speaker tonight, Professor Van der Vliet, is an expert in isotope geochemistry and head of the Department of Earth Science and Engineering at Imperial College London. Her research spans a variety of fields from understanding chemical cycles of trace elements and pollutants in the ocean to the reconstruction of ocean circulation and its relationship to climate and the history of the polar ice sheets and their vulnerability to future climate change. Tina is particularly interested in the response of the Antarctic ice sheet to warmer temperatures and the implications for future sea levels around the world. And I particularly like this. She's a stubborn optimist and values working across disciplines and in collaboration with diverse teams of people. 
During her career, Professor van der Flirt has held a number of academic positions in Europe and in the United States, and currently leads the Mass Spectrometry and Isotope Geochemistry Facility at Imperial College London. Uh, she departs for Antarctica next week to be co-chief of the upcoming Sways to Sea scientific drilling program there. Uh, Sways to Sea is an international in initiative involving researchers from New Zealand, the United States, Germany, Australia, Italy, Japan, Spain, South Korea, the Netherlands, and the United Kingdom. Esteemed guests and colleagues, please join me in welcoming Professor Tina van der Flirt to the podium. Thanks so much for this wonderful um, introduction and, and good afternoon and good evening everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to this lecture. It's an absolute honor and privilege to be here today and give um, the ST Lee lecture. I want to start with um, a picture I really like looking at. Actually back home in my office it's on the background of the big screen I have there. Um, always giving a calming influence on whoever sits on, on the office table. And it's a picture that was taken in February 2010 um, when I went on my first drilling expedition ever to the Antarctic. And that kind of expedition was quite a bit of a, a turning point uh, for me in, in my career um, as a person and as a scientist. So I wanted to start there. And um, I want to start doing like a little bit of um, my journey, and you heard some of that already in the introduction. Um, I started really growing up in the countryside, in rural Germany on a dairy farm. And um, it was a very switched on geography teacher who inspired me together with my love for nature to actually think about studying something I didn't even know existed, and that was called geology. So I kind of discovered my love for rocks, um, and that particular rock there, um, I loved a lot. That was the rock I worked on for my master's thesis. And I learned that kind of looking at that rock, it could tell you a lot of stories about our planet. And when you look at the chemistry of that rock, you can learn even more about our planet. So that, that was really intriguing. I then figured, well, if you look at the chemistry of the ocean, you can do even more. You can learn about the circulation patterns of the ocean, how it connects to climate, and then I figured, which for somebody from Europe is quite a step, if you actually look down here at the Southern Ocean where all the ocean basins connect, that's where all the music kind of happens. That's where kind of the exchange of carbon um, kind of happens and, and where the temperature gradients get set. And right in the middle of that Southern Ocean is my favorite continent, Antarctica. So I started to ask myself the question, what makes up that big continent? What are the rocks underneath all that ice? How did all that ice get on top of the continent? How much of it is there? And what happens if we melt it? What does that do to our circulation of our oceans? What does that do to sea level? So all these questions were questions which motivated me to apply to sail on this kind of particular drilling expedition back in 2010. So I want to take you on that journey, which is partially my own journey, how I came to Antarctic study. Um, but it will be a lot a journey on looking at Antarctica, looking at what it looks like today, what it looked like in the past, and what it might look like in the future. And think about that in the context of all of our future as well. Before I start, um, I just want to spend um, a little while um, making the point that all this work always is a massive team effort. I might have the privilege to stand here tonight and to present to you, but it's only thanks to having worked with like many, many, many outstanding people, and this slide just makes a start to kind of show some of them. There's many wonderful undergraduate and graduate students who worked with me over the years. There's people who inspired me. 20 years back now to even start thinking about Antarctica. Um, and then as we're talking about drilling expeditions, um, you can see at the bottom here kind of pictures from the three drilling expeditions I've been part of so far. And as you heard in the introduction as well, there's a fourth one coming up and I will talk about that towards the end of the lecture. 
All of this work we're doing is a massive team effort. Um, no person is an island and could do it on their own. It's an interdisciplinary effort, and we all benefit and learn from each other, and together we'll get there. So with this, um, I want to start us in the here and now with a bit of a motivation. So when we look at our planet today, we know that it has warmed, and it has warmed quite considerably um, since the onset of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century. So on this slide, you can see um, the temperature anomaly and um, the warming we've observed to date is a bit more than a degree of um, centigrade already. And you can see that that warming is very pronounced in the red colors kind of at the poles, and it's a bit more pronounced over the continents than over the ocean. When we think about the consequences of the global average temperature going up, we often get kind of shown picture collages like this one. So impacts of warming very often kind of get illustrated in terms of extreme weather events. You can see wildfires, um, droughts, um, floodings, kind of extreme kind of storm systems and melting of ice. And all of these pictures are absolutely real, but they feel a bit distant to us, as does global average temperature. None of us really feels global average temperature. What we feel is what happens kind of close to us. And if none of these events we see on the picture are close to us, we might still look at it and think global warming is something which doesn't really affect us. And I think we all learned, particularly in the last 10 years or so, that that picture is changing. And um, I brought up uh, one event here, which has probably been changing things for you locally here. Um, this is a picture from earlier this year when uh, the ex-tropical storm Gabriel um, stored over the Northern Ireland and there was extreme rainfall, 20 meters per hour at the peak. It affected lots of kind of uh, infrastructure um, it displaced people, people kind of were without um, homes, um, energy in their homes for a long time, and it was um, a very significant kind of um, financial damage as well. So it's events like that which kind of show us uh, that kind of climate change is not a thing of the future anymore, it's here and now, um, and it has arrived. Not every single event like this naturally is a direct consequence uh, of climate change. And I give a link there to a website which does a really good job in attributing individual events to whether they really are due to the warming we already observed or not. But one thing we all know for sure is that a warmer atmosphere can hold more water. So more extreme rainfall will always be a consequence in, in a warmer climate and will be with us kind of going into the future. When we think about the flooding that was caused in this case by this extreme kind of rainfall event, um, one thing we also have to think about is sea level rise. And we know that our seas are rising in the context of warming. A lot of it is due to the thermal expansion of the ocean and melting of mountain glaciers. Um, and that brings with it some increased flooding risks as well. And I show here a nice cartoon uh, from the New Zealand Sea Rise Project, uh, which is um, hosted at the Antarctic Research Center as well, uh, which shows at the bottom that when we bring up kind of the seas kind of from a base level a bit higher, um, obviously that increases our chances of flooding. But then if we are in an area where the land, for example, is subsiding, which around New Zealand uh, can be observed in many places as well, that makes things even worse. So what this project has produced, which I find um, absolutely inspiring, and I wish um, we should do something like that in the UK as well, is that you can go online, you can click on your own coastline and see what your stretch of land is actually doing and what the future in terms of sea level rise looks at that location. But I want to go one step further now and link it all to Antarctica. So, I said the sea level rise, a lot of it is due to kind of thermal expansion of the ocean right now. A lot of it is due to um, mountain glaciers retreating. And this is just one picture here um, from South America, the Kalkaya ice cap. You will find something similar in the Southern Alps as well if you look there. But the big joint in the whole sea level equation really is our polar ice caps. Um, so today we have about seven meters worth of sea level equivalent of water tied up as ice on top of Greenland. 
and there's about 58 meters in total on Antarctica. And I divided Antarctica here into a smaller western part and a, a larger eastern part, and um, we'll see kind of in the next slide while well, we'll do that. So let's see whether that, that animation actually plays now. It does. Wonderful. Um, so we're looking here at a record um, of ice loss in Antarctica from the year 2000 going up to the present day, so a 20-year record. So we're looking at mass loss, and the line kind of moves forward here in this record. And as the line moves forward, you can see on the continent, um, showing up in yellow and then red and dark red colors, areas where the mass loss of ice is observed. And that's observations from satellites um, today. And you can see, as this record moves on, that one area in Western Antarctica starts standing out very, very pronouncedly. And that's the area of the Amundsen Sea um, around the Twaits I, um, and Pine Island glacier systems you will probably all have heard around. So when we get to the end of that record now, we see a lot of mass loss in Western Antarctica, and we can see relatively little mass loss in, in the bigger part of Eastern Antarctica. So again, Eastern Antarctica holds around 53 meters worth of sea level. So that's, if you think in London terms, all the way up to the clock of Big Ben. That's normally how we think about Eastern Arctic uh, ice volume. Um, West Antarctica, the five meters, is not even the diameter of the clock of Big Ben. Um, that's five meters. So this is what the situation kind of looks like at the moment. And I want to spend one slide on explaining why that is, because we have a pretty good understanding these days why that is. And that goes back to kind of thinking a bit about the rocks underneath the ice. So if we remove all the ice that sits on the continent today, um, that's what the continent would look like. The yellow to brown colors are bits of the continent which are above sea level, and the blue areas are areas which are below sea level. So we can see pretty much all of West Antarctica is showing up as blue here. So it's below sea level, and that's what we call marine-based ice. So the ice sheet there is in direct contact with the ocean. In contrast, East Antarctica, most of it is actually above sea level. And um, there's some little cartoons to the right here. The reason why a marine-based ice sheet is so much more vulnerable to potential melting, like we observe it today in the satellite record, is that the ice sheet kind of ends in a floating ice shelf, and that ice shelf can basically, um, when it's on a shelf where warm water intrudes underneath it, be eaten up not just from above, but also from below. So you get, basically get heat working on it from two angles, and once you lose that buttressing ice shelf, you can kind of collapse the ice in the hinterland. And we know from observational data that kind of heat... In, form of warm water is actually coming to the shores of West Antarctica, as you can see at the bottom here with the pink to red colors, um, exactly in those areas where we can see the mass loss. So let's do a little summary where we got so far. Um, the observation is that Antarctica is losing mass um, as the planet is warming. The concern now is that, of course, many of us live close to the shorelines. There's a growing kind of global population of people who live close to the sea, and understanding what lies ahead of us in terms of sea level rise is actually really important. The solution I want to offer, obviously, as you can tell from, from the title of my talk, is that we can use the geological past now and use the drill record we have um, to understand what might lie ahead of us. And that's what we're going to do now. And in order to kind of um, get your mindset into the right time periods I want to talk about in the geological past, we can start with a kind of modern thermometer. And this thermometer is colored in now in terms of temperatures our planet might reach in the next 100 years. So the green areas here are basically warming up to one and a half degrees. Yellow is up to two degrees, and then we go to three, four, and five degrees. So the nations of the world agreed that we should try to keep warming below two degrees, ideally below 1.5 degrees, and that's kind of the green and yellow parts here. But the reality 
the basically trajectory we are currently on as enshrined in law is um, the blue box here. So we're currently on a trajectory to warming by the end of this century of 2.7 degrees. So there's still a bit of a difference between our ambition uh, and what we're doing right now. But we can use now Earth's history because in Earth's history it has been warmer in the past as well and find basically temperature analog times for, for any of these future times. So if we look at warming of one to one and a half degrees Celsius, so the kind of range we ideally want to be in, we can look at a time period called the last interglacial, some 125,000 years ago. And if we want to look at what the trajectory we're currently on with three to four degrees, uh, degrees warming uh, would look like, we can look at a period called the Pliocene warm time. So in very simple terms, we can kind of step back in time, um, kind of use, follow our footprints here, and study Antarctica's response to these sorts of temperatures. And that's exactly what I want to show you now. So we go back to that expedition, that beautiful picture I showed you in the beginning. Um, and that expedition was um, an IODP expedition, which sailed actually out of Wellington uh, here in 2010. That was my first time I came to visit. Uh, we sailed on, on this beautiful drill ship, the Georges Resolution, and um, we came out of Wellington down to the shores of East Antarctica and then back into Australia. And you could see on the picture, probably just about kind of my orange hair, and if you look very carefully, two people next to me is a probably much younger version of the current director of the Antarctic Research Centre as well, Rob Mackay, who was on that expedition as well. And that's where we first met and collaborated ever since. So, what is it like to sail down there? Um, if you haven't been, if you get seasick, I recommend you don't go. Um, the Southern Ocean is, is very much known for its high waves. There's strong winds going across, and that is just a view standing at the, the back end of the ship. And yes, that's a wave and not a mountain on land or so. Um, I very much like it. I you know, go up to the bridge and enjoy the high waves, but um, I can tell you there was a lot of people pretty sick during that crossing. Um, what is really cool is once you kind of get to a certain degree kind of beyond the Southern Ocean, uh, it calms down quite dramatically. And that's what the view looked like. Um, you can see the Eastern Arctic ice sheet in the background here, some grounded icebergs. The foreground um, during the couple of hours where the sun went a bit lower and then up again. And um, the next slide is what it looked like during the day shift. So that's my favorite picture because I was working on the day shift. And this is what it looks like when you know it's kind of time to go home. So kind of towards the end of February, early March, this is what the beginning of sea ice formation looks like. So what did we get on this expedition? Um, the expedition was a real gold mine for all kinds of things. And I just want to touch on the two time periods I introduced, the Pliocene and then this last interglacial time period. So up here is the mud we recovered from the Pliocene. Um, it was a time period, as I said, three to five million years ago. CO2 in the atmosphere back then was not too dissimilar to what we have right now. So we're currently at 420 ppm. Um, the range kind of was between 350 and 450 ppm back then. But global temperatures were quite a bit warmer. So that's the equilibrium response of the system to that sort of greenhouse gas forcing in the atmosphere, two and a half to four degrees. And interestingly, if we look at global sea level, and we can kind of reconstruct that from looking at shorelines around the continents, that was quite a bit higher, 10 to 25 meters. And if we now think about where that sea level comes from, uh, there's some kind of interesting thinking to be done. So in the Pliocene, we think probably most of Greenland uh, would have deglaciated, so that's five to seven meters of sea level. We think that probably most of West Antarctica has deglaciated, three to five meters of sea level, but that still just about guess it's slightly over 10 meters, uh, and we know some from some other work um, done here in New Zealand as well, that just the amplitude of sea level change during that time was around 30 meters or so. So we probably actually look for some contribution from Eastern Arctica. So how do we get that? How do we get that evidence? And this is my one slide of not talking about isotope geochemistry, but explaining the principle behind it. 
So what we basically do is um, we just look at the chemical fingerprint of the mud and sand we recover from the bottom of the ocean. And the idea there is that like with our fingerprints or our DNA, every rock basically is quite unique depending on how old it is and how it's um, composed. And so any rocks on the continent, when you erode them, grind them down, and deposit them in the ocean, they, they don't change certain chemical signatures. So you can trace that signature back. So if you have a drill core, say, here in the ocean, and you go back in time and you hit that red layer, you can, from the chemical fingerprint, then say that that layer is the same stuff as the rock all the way inland here. So our interpretation then would be that you have to retreat the ice margin all the way till you erode that red, red rock and bring it out to the ocean. So it's around a few corners, but it's basically using chemical fingerprints and the sediments to learn where the ice margin was. To do that, you need quite fancy laboratories, and um, I just wanted to share some of the pictures of um, our wonderful and uh, world-class laboratories we have at Imperial College in our mass spectrometry and isotope geochemistry group in earth science and engineering. So what did we find? Um, it's one of, I think, only two slides with wiggly lines, so ignore the wiggly lines on it. Um, this is basically a graph of the sediments we recovered for this kind of Pliocene warm period. And from the sediments, from the look of the sediments, we can kind of say there were warmer times, and there were colder times in there. And I marked up the warmer times in this pink bands here in this sequence. And on the right hand side is the chemical fingerprints we measured. And all you need to take away from that is, is that there are systematic variations. Um, the chemical fingerprint goes back and forth, and it does so together with warmer and colder times. So it kind of correlates. And here's the headline of the paper we published from that. We kind of concluded that you have a very dynamic behavior of the eastern Arctic ice sheet margin in that area. And the reason why we saw that is we looked more carefully um, at the geology under the ice and compared the different fingerprints. And we figured that during colder time intervals, our drill site, the Southern Ocean is to the top of the slide now, um, looks like the rocks kind of in really coastal areas around the Ninus Glacier. Um, and that is very much what we see today as well. But then during warmer times, it's very different. So the kind of yellow to green areas are deep subglacial basins in this part of East Antarctica. And we think that the ice margin retreated quite a bit on land um, till you get that kind of lithology, which I gave the green color here, and you shed that material all the way out to the shelf. So again, repeated advances and retreats of the ice in this area, the Wilk subglacial basin. So I put this cartoon in there to give me a minute to kind of pause, actually, because when we kind of published that paper and found those results, that was actually quite a big deal. It was something we didn't quite expect for that area. And I want to reiterate why we didn't quite expect it on this cartoon. So um, a continental based ice sheet is an ice sheet which sits on bedrock above sea level. And we saw most of eastern Arctica is of that nature. On the other hand, on the left of this diagram here, a marine-based ice sheet like West Antarctica sits on bedrock below sea level, and that is kind of a lot easier to melt. So that was our kind of general starting point. But if we go back now at that map I showed you earlier where we remove all the ice from the continent, you can see that there is quite a few areas in East Antarctica which have blue colors as well. So East Antarctica has basically quite a bit of marine-based ice as well. And if we add all of that up, that's about 19 meters worth of marine-based ice. And the Wilkes subglacial basin where we drilled, so the star is our drill site, is one of those areas. There's two others, the Aurora and the Recovery Basin, which definitely kind of require a lot of attention as well. So in that sense, not too surprising. We, we just basically drilled in front of these areas, which is quite vulnerable as well. Does that conform with any other evidence from the area? I put another kind of star on the map here. So if we just go around the corner into the Ross Sea area, it actually nicely links up to some uh, phenomenal work which um, was done some years before with the Andro project. And again, that was a project which was heavily driven out of uh, the Antarctic Research Center as well. And 
um, deployed the first kind of geological drilling that was ever done from an ice shelf as a platform. So there's a lot of really impressive engineering going on there. Um, so a drill rig was put kind of on the floating ice shelf and then a long sediment record was recovered. And when we look at that sediment record, I'm just focusing in on this Pliocene time here. There's kind of these sick yellow units in, in the sediments. And what those units were, were basically marine algae. Um, so you can see the picture at the top there in green layers. And what they signalize is that you had basically open ocean conditions at the site. So they sat around the corner in the Ross Sea. You had open marine conditions. The ice shelf was gone. And at the bottom, you can see a simulation from an ice sheet model, which kind of says, well, you probably looked at a collapsed Western Arctic ice sheet. And that's why you see open ocean conditions. This is what kind of a modern situation looked like. And this is a more expanded situation. But what I want to pay attention to is um, zooming in here again, uh, the site from the Ross Sea and our new drill site. This particular ice sheet model, back then when it was published, doesn't show any ice retreat in the area I just talked about. So this is why kind of people weren't initially uh, fully convinced um, about our results. Um, but I think it triggered a really, really nice dialogue between ice sheet models and data producing people, which has been ongoing uh, ever since and started before that already. So it's not that we are the first, but there's a really good interplay now. And I kind of just show a picture here of what I call the old Pliocene. So that's what the, the models kind of saw the Pliocene look like. And then you can see at the bottom here, if you kind of think a little bit uh, about like the physics and the models and some processes you could put in, this is just one kind of output how a new Pliocene could look like. And you can see big kind of ice retreat now in the area where we observed it with our records as well. So that's kind of the Pliocene done. I want to take you one step further and have a look at the Pleistocene now, because that is now the time analog where temperatures are pretty much in the range where we are to today already. So we're just looking at a couple degrees warmer than pre-industrial. During that time, sea level globally was dependent on which of these interglacials in the late Pleistocene we look at 5 to 13 meters higher than today. If we just look at the last interglacial, maybe 5 to 10 meters or so. So if we play our game again and think about where is that sea level coming from, well, in this case, um, there has to be some ice left on Greenland because we have ice cores which actually go back to that age, um, particularly the last interglacial. So we're probably only looking at a couple of meters out of Greenland. West Antarctica, well, most people think West Antarctica probably was gone. So again, we look at three to five meters. We can add like a meter for thermal expansion and mountain glacier melting. Um, so if you add all of this up, you kind of get there already. So you don't necessarily need like a huge Eastern Arctic um, composition or contribution. Um, but we saw, well, we seem to have the perfect drill site now. Let's have a look and see whether Eastern Antarctica did something there as well. And to cut a long story short, um, I show you kind of the second wiggly line of the day. So basically our chemical fingerprints and our sediments from the last 500,000 years at that drill site co-varied nicely with temperature as well and actually indicated that we had ice loss as well. And that is kind of really highlighted in, in this graph. So in the middle is our record of the chemical fingerprint going back and forth again. And it's plotted here with a global sea level curve at the top and local temperatures in Antarctica at the bottom. And what we basically found is if you put the local temperature above a certain threshold, and in this case, it's about two degrees locally, that's not global average temperature, that's local temperature in Antarctica, then you start getting retreat of the ice margin into the Wilkes subglacial basin. So that, that was really kind of um, a big finding. So let's summarize some answers. I said I will talk about some questions and some answers in my talk today. Um, we found quite a few answers from that expedition, and there's many more um, I don't touch on today. The low-lying areas of the eastern Arctic ice sheet in the Wilkes subglacial basin contributed to sea level rise, and they did so not only during the Pliocene warm period, which many of us might have expected, they also did so for the late Pleistocene when temperatures only were a couple of degrees warmer. 
So one way how I often summarize this is by plotting up global temperatures on the x-axis and then sea level on the y-axis. We put like big boxes because there's big uncertainties on all of this there for our paleo time periods. And we can see kind of uh, the sea level that would have corresponded to the warming of the Pliocene and the Pleistocene. And on the left-hand side, I give you here all our components of ice that's quite vulnerable to to warming temperatures, the Western Arctic, the Greenland, and the marine-based parts of Eastern Arctica. Together, that's about 30 meters. When we look at the projections where sea level would go by the end of this century, um, they are in the range of 20 centimeters to a meter. And you don't need to be a scientist to realize that that kind of blue line at the bottom here doesn't fully align with what we see from the geological past. So the message here is, and that has been nicely put together in the recent report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the message really is that sea level rise is a slow response to warming, and it's a response that will go on for hundreds to thousands of years into the future. So whatever we're doing right now, we're not seeing the full consequence of that. And in the report, they kind of summarize this in, in boxes for one and a half to four degrees warming. And um, you probably can't quite read it, but on the left hand side, that would be the sea level rise you get after 2,000 years. On the right hand side, after 10,000 years. So that's way beyond our lifetimes. But that's kind of the commitments we are making today. And if you go basically from here, the best case scenario that looks at two meters of sea level rise all the way over to the right, that gets us into the 30 meters I mentioned we have available in vulnerable ice. So a critical question then is how much and how fast? How much sea level rise will we get and how fast will it happen? And that critically depends on two things. It depends on our own actions, it depends on the future emissions we still put into the atmosphere and the warming that creates. But it also depends um, on some of our scientific understanding in terms of the ice sheet responses. So when we look at projections for sea level rise at the moment, everybody agrees that the biggest uncertainty is that we don't exactly know what happens with Antarctica. So it's still something um, we need kind of to work on. And I want to focus on, on that last question, which leads me into the final bit of my talk, uh, which is the question kind of whether the West Antarctic ice sheet actually collapsed in the most recent past when it was just a couple of degrees warmer than today. So it's a hypothesis which was postulated back in the 1970s that that would happen. And there's like 45 years worth of science now looking into this. And the honest answer is that we still don't have any data which tell us whether the West Antarctic ice sheet did collapse when it was a couple of degrees warmer than today or not. What we do have is a lot of very sophisticated numerical models which predict that that kind of will happen at some point. But if you look at different snapshots of models here, the output actually can vary quite a bit. You can get like an open seaway kind of under warming of a couple of three degrees you can get like a situation where you just get like a bigger area and the Ross Sea that opens up. Or on the right hand side, you can get a situation where the Amundsen Sea area, which is melting fast today, opens up, but the Ross Sea pretty much stays the same. And all these different solutions actually have implications. And it's quite important to figure out what we are looking at. So in a moment of frustration, I asked ChatGPT. So that was coming probably out of a faculty meeting at work and thinking, like, how do we deal with teaching our students when they ask all these artificial chat box everything? So I asked ChatGPT, what, you know, when did the Western Arctic ice sheet last collapse? And ChatGPT, and I should qualify here, that was in February 2023, so it was when it kind of just, you know, was out, brand new. And it gave me a very certain and very quick answer. The most recent collapse of the Western Arctic ice sheet occurred about 10,000 years ago. Total rubbish. Okay, so I was like, oh, good. Okay, chat GPT doesn't have a clue. I, I, I did ask it yesterday again, and, and that's kind of, you know, the scary bit we all have to get our heads around. It learns really, really fast, because every time we ask it, it kind of, you know, figures out that there is something to be learned. Um, so it says now that... Um, its knowledge is limited to January 22, so like, if I know something since then, of course it can't know that. Um, uh, 
there was probably no recent full collapse of the Western Arctic ice sheet, but you know, it realizes it's really a topic of concern. We should think about it. And if you really want to know, you should basically talk to a scientist and figure out from them what their kind of news inside is. Great. So conclusion here, it's still up to us um, to go and find that all kind of elusive evidence for when the Western Arctic ice sheet last collapsed. And that's exactly the expeditions uh, we're going to set off. Uh, well, I'm going to set off next week. Uh, some other people are well on their way already. Um, and the project is the Swayze to Sea Project, which stands for the sensitivity of the Western Arctic ice sheet to two degrees warming. So that's the Paris um, uh, agreement target the world set out. And you heard in the introduction, there's kind of, you know, 10 different countries involved in this, uh, lots of funding agencies, institutions, uh, intercontinental uh, drilling kind of um, program giving, giving us funding for that. So it's a huge international effort to actually set off uh, and, and answer that question. What we are trying to do is we're trying to go to two drill sites shown here as, as the red kind of dots um, on the eastern side of the Ross ice shelf. So we're looking basically at that interface where the floating ice shelf goes over into the grounded ice sheet. Our first drill site will be um, close to the grounding zone of the Kump ice stream, and the second one is over here at the Query ice race. Um, we are operational right now. The Traverse team is on the way to kind of bring kind of our equipment to the site along hopefully this blue dotted line somewhere. I didn't check this morning where they are now. Um, some of the camp staff and engineers um, kind of tried to fly out from Christchurch this morning. I heard they boomeranged, but you know, they will try to fly out tomorrow again. Um, and hopefully uh, myself and others will then get down there kind of next week and we'll fly to Scott Base and from there into our deep field site. So what we'll do, uh, and again, there's amazing kind of uh, development, uh, design, and build involved here coming out of the Antarctic Research Center. Uh, we're going to melt a 30 centimeter hole through the Ross Ice Shelf. Then there's a bit of an ocean cavity underneath. And then we'll deploy a brand new sediment coring system, the AID system, which has been designed and built specifically for this project. We all really hope that it goes well, because if it does, it's technology which could be used for a lot of other projects as well. So there's a lot of fantastic um, development that has been going into this. And our goal is at both sides to drill up to 200 meters of sediment and bring that back and learn from that what actually happened. So here's the approach, very similar to what was done with the Andro project, just that we are now far, far away from a base. We are 800 kilometers away. We have a lightweight drill rig uh, we can transport there and do it at a lot lower cost uh, than has been done before. So wish us luck. Um, it's a really, really exciting project. By just getting sediments, again, we'll see where we're in a situation under an ice shelf like today in a situation where it was colder, with grounded ice, or did we encounter open marine kind of conditions with kind of, you know, algae mats like we've seen in the Pliocene and the Andro side. So one of the questions we really want to get kind of um, to is when will we lose the Ross Ice Shelf? And I want to finish with that question because there was recently some work published which has gotten a lot of media attention um, from the Amundsen Sea area, so that was an area where modeling work was done, which basically showed that the warming and the ice loss we're seeing there at the moment already reached one of these points of no return, so it's already irreversible. Um, no matter whether we stop emitting more CO2 tomorrow and stop kind of warming from happening. So um, the conclusion of the paper was that the ice in this area, the Amundsen Sea, basically is going to be lost no matter what we do. And I think some of us really looked at that and said, well, that's quite a bleak message. And it is important that scientists openly speak the truth, what they find. But we looked at our area here, the Ross Sea we're going to, and um, as you can see from this map again here, which is basically the temperatures around the margin of the Western Arctic ice sheet, the Ross Sea is in a very different situation. We don't have warm waters coming underneath the Ross ice shelf at the moment, um, like we do in the Amazon Sea. So there's cold water in the cavity. And that kind of potentially makes a huge, huge difference. And on the right-hand side here, you can see um, some modeling work done by scientists at the ARC and at GNS, 
which shows that, yes, if we go down in the future on a low emission pathway, so we keep to keeping warming below two degrees, uh, we might lose the Twaits Glacier. But if you look at the Ross Sea, uh, that area doesn't show red colors. So we could still save the Ross Ice Shelf, and that buttresses a lot of the Western Arctic Ice Sheet. So that means we're not committed to losing the entire Western Arctic Ice Sheet. If you go down a high emission pathway in contrary, the Ross Ice Sheet starts showing up um, in red colors as well. So there's really important messages here. And we really have to ask the question to the geological record to figure out what happens in that area. And we just put out um, a story in the conversation two days ago for those of you who want to learn a bit more about that. So with this, um, I'm coming to my end and I want to go back to the pictures I started off with on, on my own journey, kind of, you know, coming from the countryside and, and evolving and becoming the scientist I am right now. Um, there's a lot to be grateful for, and I'm particularly grateful and excited about setting foot kind of on Antarctica next week. It's just the sea ice. It's kind of, you know, the ice shelf. It's not really the continent. But um, I've been on ships around the continent a lot. It will be an absolute pleasure to go and visit it for the first time. And what really gives me hope for that white continent is that the future of it really still is in our hands. There might be bits of it which kind of reach tipping points already we can't do anything about anymore, but there's definitely big parts of it where we still have a lot of say in how the future evolution will go with our behavior going forward. And I want to finish with a quote from Amanda Gorman, which is, change is made of choices, and choices are made of character. And I want to use that quote to just say that not all the people on this planet um, actually have the means to make choices. And that it's really up to us who have the means to make the right choices and show the right actions. Thank you. Um, I'm Rob Mackay, Director of Te Puna Pātiotea, the Antarctic Research Centre at uh, Te Heronga Waka, and it's my great pleasure to um, you know, give a thank you for that, that, that talk, Tina. It was, um, you know, um, thank Tina um, for you know, explaining this, this, I mean I've seen this journey quite a few times, but explaining a really riveting journey. I was really riveted throughout that, even though I've seen a lot of that data myself. Um, just that relevance towards the future as well, that you could use this past ice sheet change, but then clearly tie it into what are the implications for this for us in the future and how can we potentially still decide what that future will be. So I first met Tina in, 13 years ago in 2010, that's the expedition that Tina pointed out, and um, she said it was her first time she'd come to the Southern Hemisphere, and one of the things that she'd kind of overlooked on that, and she's very famous for her red hair, and, um, but she was red all over. She'd, um, She's a world expert, as you can tell from that talk. She's a world expert in the oceans, a world expert in the ice sheets, but she'd forgotten about the atmospheric processes of the ozone hole. So um, she has been very, very careful on this trip to um, sunscreen first thing in the morning when she wakes up. And I'm sure you'll be doing that down the ice where it gets even more extreme. Now, as Antarctic geologists, you know, drillers, so we'd had a lot of experience in the Antarctic Research Centre around doing drilling of the continental shelves and looking at that physical footprint of the ice sheet sitting down. So the sedimentology that Tina showed um, very, very nicely and summed up. But what Tina brought to the table, and this is where I really realised she was a, a, a really diverse talent that was really critical for Antarctica, was bringing these geochemical tools, because this allowed us to reach a part of the ice sheet that was almost impossible to do via those techniques of drilling through ice sheets. So this was, um, I, I think you can tell from that talk, this was really revolutionary globally and it's fundamentally changed the way we've seen those ice sheets and how they might project future sea level rise that, that will affect us in New Zealand. So that, that connection between people seeing physical change and we're seeing that today with coastal erosion ar around our country. Now, she did conclude with that message that we do have a choice and it's a very clear choice that we do need to meet that Paris Agreement target. Right? And that, that's fundamental, that 1.5 degree threshold really does appear to be a threshold where we will start to lose those ice shelves. And, but it is a message of hope. We can slow down the rates and saving the Ross ice shelf in particular is one of the keys, um, key buttressing points of that ice sheet that will keep it stable. 
Now, I'm really ex excited to see Tina travelling south to Antarctica for the first time, as you say, standing foot on the continent. It's very frustrating being on a drill ship and not actually being able to see the continent, but not actually be able to go and see all of its, its wonders. So, um, as, as Tina showed, it's a journey of discovery. Um, it's not without its challenges, right? This is a very ambitious project. You know, we've never done this before. Um, I'm just really glad we have people like Tina that are really ready for that challenge and actually going down there and taking it on because it really does have important implications for us all. So on behalf of Tuhera and Waka and um, Te Puna Pateatea, the Antarctic Research Centre, I thank you again for your talk and I'll, I'll open the floor for, for questions. Microphone coming behind you. Oh, thank you. Hello. Um, my name's Mary Redmayne. Thank you for your talk. Um, I did honours in environmental studies about 2009, so about the time you first went to Antarctica. And there was a lot of talk about keeping it to below one degree. Um, and even then, I thought this is a very strange way of expressing it by averaging, because to most people, a very common response at the time was, oh great, I'd love it to be a degree warmer. Um, and so it's very hard for many people to understand the concept of an average um, heating. And the map you showed right at the beginning, I think, is a mu speaks much more strongly, especially since a huge, a huge number of influential and rich people live in the bit that's going to be warmest. So... Is there any sort of hope of getting their message across with a map like that or a, an indication that of which bits are going to get most hotter, so, sorry, getting hotter sooner? Yes, yeah, thanks, thanks for that question. Um, I, I think the you touch on a very important point of how we communicate that. And as, as human species, I think we're not good to reacting to facts and numbers. We're good um, at reacting to lived experiences, um, as I tried to make the connection as well. And I think it's important to acknowledge this global warming is not like a global kind of feature which looks the same everywhere, as you nicely summarized. It's going to warm more over the poles, and that has to do with, with the planetary kind of balances, um, how temperatures work on our planet. And while we have to, as scientists, look at that global average number, because that determines the baseline of how you shift the whole system up and down, and from which certain processes then kick in, like extreme weather events or, or other things. So it determines how much kind of the warming water in the, in the sea expands. Um, how, how we really bring that better kind of to people, what it means. Um, I, I think it would be dangerous if we go down and just say there's one area which gets very hot. Typically, that's the Arctic, right? So don't, you know, try to live too close to there. But you're fine if you live, say, somewhere around the equator. Um, the, the whole baseline of the system shifts, as I said. And so it will affect all of us. The question is just when um, and not if. And I think that is something important to keep in mind and that we should not like sit back to wait till we feel these extreme events and do something a bit earlier. How many degrees would you, do you think it shifts per year on a... Um, if we take um, the medium line, where is, where is the, what's that word? Um, the equator, what, how many, what percentage would it shift towards? It's, um, it, it probably tails um, a bit back to the last question. It's, it's not a very linear process, and there's many reasons. There's many feedbacks in the climate system which make it um, a process which you can't from year to year track, which is why looking at 10 years' worth of temperature data can sometimes give a very misleading record whether there's a general trend going on. So you always have to look over longer time intervals. 
we had so far a bit more than a degree, 1.1 or 1.2 degrees warming since the 19th century. So the baseline is typically 1850 to 1900. So we could do the mass, right? So that's 120 years, 1.2 degrees. That gives you kind of the gradient um, of, of what the warming is kind of in general doing, but it is a direct response of the CO2 in the atmosphere. So there's a direct physical connection with how many greenhouse gases are in the atmosphere and what warming that kind of reacts to. But the fact that it's not always super linear has to do with all the feedbacks in the climate system, which can kind of play a role. I hope that helps a bit. If you know the answer, you could join us. Um, <laughs> um, so the, the maximum we're hoping for is, is 200 meters. That's the specification of the, the rubric. Um, I think all of us agree any bit of sediment we get from that location is a, a huge success. Uh, we're going somewhere where no human beings have been before and recovered sediment from. Uh, there is a lot of, and I uh, quite honestly always call it a bit of geofantasy going on. We kind of do very careful surveys at these sites, and of course we have ideas what we think we'll recover at both of these sites. Uh, we, we are hoping for something which is kind of the last yeah, five, ten million years at, at the first drill site, most certainly much older at the second drill site, where we probably go more to 20, 30 million years as well. We have to drill to know whether that is true. Um, I might be standing here in two months' time and say, well, you know, we got something totally different, but we got something, and we can think about that now. So that's, I think, the situation I hope to be in. <laughs> No, no, no. This, this is probably the bit I know least about, um, because it's a, a newly developed system. Uh, I have not seen it being operated. It has been uh, tested in a quarry. I know there's a couple of people in the audience, uh, including uh, probably Rob, who could answer that much better. Um, how long will it take? I mean, just look at Richard. Do you have an idea? <laughs> we, we've got about two to three weeks to drill 200 meters, and it will take as long as it takes. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's, if, it depends what we're drilling. If the, if the rock is soft and you can get, uh, I think each time we run the, 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 the barrel that collects the core, it's about three and a half meters most, that most we can get. And then it takes a little bit of time to pull it back up to the surface. So um, when we're finished at the end of the season, we'll be able to tell you much more clearly how long it took. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thanks, Tina. Uh, Rick, Rex one um, here. Uh, <laughs> super interesting presentation. I guess just following on from that question, how long does it take to get from the field work to you know the analysis and published papers? And then, do you have any sort of commentary in terms of we've got COP twenty eight coming up, um, a key global stock take, the interplay between the science IPCC reports and the UNFCCC process, and um, any sort of insights on that and views on how that interplay could improve as we get a better understanding. Thanks. Yeah, um, fantastic questions. Um, so the the time scale for getting, getting any sort of answers and results, um, I would say there's kind of two extremes, right? So if we go and, you know, we drill sediment and we find these kind of open marine algae layers, honestly, if the drill core comes up and we look at the ends of it, we'll probably be able to tell you uh, that we kind of drilled one of these last interglacials. We have a microscope on site. If, you know, the people who are specialists and looking at the little organisms in there can tell us exactly what age it is, we might come back from the ice with a first order answer. That's hugely optimistic, but that could happen. The, the more realistic case where we got kind of material where we don't see immediately what it will tell us, and we have to go into my world and do the chemical analysis, we're normally looking at a process of like a good year to two of analysis, 
bringing it together from different angles. We have a science team of, of more than 100 people who will deploy all kinds of different methods. We work very carefully on sample flows so that we share the material and all work together. Um, but, you know, I would say if after two or three years uh, we kind of, you know, have, have solid evidence, that's, I think, what we get from most of these drilling expeditions for the first big papers. Um, in terms of the policy process, yeah, um, I wish, sorry, that didn't, shouldn't come across um, as desperate as it sounded. I sometimes wish we, we have um, a, a stronger kind of direct pass into some of these negotiations. And um, I can't hide that as scientists, I'm sometimes at loss what words and what descriptions we have to use to make the consequences of what we do clearer and make people who are in positions to make decisions understand that better and understand and I'm saying that from a UK angle now, that it's not just about the next elections, what policy decisions we make, um, but that it's really our own future and future of humanity we're kind of playing with here. Um, the planet Earth will be fine. I'm not worried about our planet. It's, it's how we are getting on with it all. So um, I think there's a lot to be done to kind of work closer to people who have understanding how to get into that policy space. And I know we have colleagues who do that. I might be inclined to do that myself at some point. It's something I, I find really, really important. And sometimes going back to the lab and just doing the measurements is not cutting it anymore when the world is not listening. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure quite how to word my question, but I'm just wondering the relevance of volcanic activity on the CO2 emissions and what the comparison would be from the Pleistocene era to modern day, and if you take that into account. The connectivity of the CO2 to the temperatures, you mean? Or, yeah. So um, during the Pliocene, um, as I said, the CO2 levels were very similar to what we are now. So um, CO2 as a greenhouse gas in the atmosphere um, has a direct warming effect. We call that the Planck response. Uh, so it's direct physics in how more greenhouse gases basically keep more of the long wave radiation that comes off the Earth in our atmosphere and don't allow it to go back to space. And that kind of direct warming effect we can quantify really well. Um, and, and that kind of then gets bounced into positive and ne negative feedback loops as well, uh, which kind of double that direct effect. So we knew that basically for a doubling of CO2 in the atmosphere, um, we kind of can expect something in the order of three degrees of warming, two to four degrees. Um, so that is not exactly the Pliocene analog, but it gives you a bit of an idea. And these, these are numbers based on the hard physics of the system. So they are... Um, they pretty clear. So that Pliocene response, when it was two to four degrees warmer, that CO2 was, um, you know, about the same it is right now. That is kind of the natural equilibrium response of the system. And if you give the system then thousands of years to kind of react to that equilibrium, you get your sea level up 10 to 20 meters. That's just, um, yeah, how the system kind of reacts to these sorts of forcings. I just wondered, is there more or less volcanic activity now than there was back then? Um, volcanic activity is kind of an intermittent force, as we call it. So it's whenever you get a really strong volcanic emission, which goes all the way up to the stratosphere, and that's important, uh, that it goes all the way up. The aerosols can act as a cooling agent, so it leads to a couple of degrees of cooling uh, when you have big volcanic eruptions. Um, for a few years. So that's the extent of how it can influence the climate system. Um, so you see it in our observational record of the last 150 years. You can make out big volcanic eruptions like Mount Pinatubo in 1991. You can see a blip in the temperature record. Um, but like you can't see it um, on the long-term record as a driver for any of the change. Thank you, Tina. So, as you saw from that last response, she is an expert in the atmosphere, so I, I stand corrected. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'd just like to thank you once again for that fantastic lecture. Um, just a round of applause for that. that um, yeah.